So it's a framework that favors the honest over the crooked. Now that may sound obvious, but it's not obvious. It's a framework, for example, which would be very tough on passing bad checks because it is a deliberate act to defraud your neighbor. And so it would say, hey, we want to really reward honesty. We want to set a standard of honesty. We want a standard of not taking from your neighbor. Very different kind of society. And Smith saw economics, the wealth of nations, as a part of this much larger picture, which begins with the notion that if we're going to have a free society, if we're really going to, if you think about it, free societies require enormous levels of trust. We'll form a partnership. We'll both work at it. That's a very high level of honesty. That's an assumption that you're not going to try to rig the game and cheat me. If you live in a society, as, as there are cultures on the planet where people don't trust each other. They wake up in the morning with distrust. In that kind of a society, it's very hard to work together to be creative. Because I assume you're going to cheat me, so I've got to figure out also. This is why lawyers are devastating to American civilization. Because lawyers create an adversarial environment. I mean, if you live in a country where there are TV commercials that basically say, if you haven't sued somebody recently, why don't you bring your Rolodex down and let us go over it together? <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the, the legal system of adversarial thinking is devastating to an entrepreneurial society. Because it begins to break down the barrier of friendship and relationship and trust and begins to say, what and we're having, I mean, I found it in my own business now that, that I have, there are moments when the lawyers who now are trying to protect me and make sure I don't do anything are saying, well, if you do X, it will set up Y. So you, you, you're being told, don't do the common sense, compassionate, decent thing because it'll be a pretext for a lawsuit. You've got you to wake up every morning assuming every person you deal with could potentially sue you. Now, that is death to an entrepreneurial society. The lawyers. And, a, and a, totally mis, a totally misshaped understanding of what the purpose of a legal system is. It is not the purpose of a legal system to find ultimate justice at the ultimate end, no matter how destructive the total cost. The purpose of a legal system is to create a framework in which people live together with reasonable costs, solving problems in a reasonable way. And what you have today is, is, a, is a legal structure which is dominated by the trial lawyers, who make the money by the lawsuits who rigged the game in favor of more lawsuits. I mean, it's a very sick system. And, and it has to be thoroughly overhauled. Huh? Yes, can be sure. That's what we're all about. That's what you come to the town hall meeting. Um, Are you doing a town hall meeting today? Uh, sure. Every t noon in Woodstock. I do it every, every Saturday. Uh, but, the, but my point is, as you think about it culturally, this is a cultural point. It's a point Deming makes in his book. That he says, the two greatest challenges to us in the world market as a society are the cost of health care and the legal system which creates adversarial psychology. And that comes right back to this notion. To have an entrepreneurial free society, you have to consciously cultivate honesty and a sense of trust. And you have to instill that. And you have to reward those who follow it. And you have to punish those who break it. Otherwise, and punishment can be things as simple as economic cost. I don't mean put them in jail. But finding ways to, as somebody once said, reestablishing shame. You know, recreating a sense of that's bad behavior. That's unacceptable. Now, in that framework, let me just suggest to you, that markets reinforce success, but bureaucracies reinforce the failure to get accurate information. That to maximize your own success, you have to emphasize honesty and integrity and discourage misleading or dishonest information. This goes right back to remember the notion that if you, if you put on a dress or a suit that doesn't look good, in a truly healthy society, you would like your closest friend to suggest to you taking it back. Wouldn't you? And is, isn't that the real, the real fact that you'd, you'd like to get honest feedback? But to get honest feedback, you have to live in a society which values it. On the other hand, if you think you'll be punished for giving honest feedback, you know, complain about us and we'll see that your papers get lost and you won't, the bureaucracy won't approve it for three months. Or, you know, mess with me and you won't get tenure or mess with me and you won't get a good grade. And so the more you can get down to a marketplace, the further you can get away from bureaucracies and credentialing, the better off. This fits, by the way, the one uniquely American philosophy, pragmatism, uh, as developed by William James. Pragmatism, which, which actually grew out, and James uh, gives credit to, an earlier American who'd written uh, an article, in a, actually in a scientific magazine, uh, is, is a fascinating concept. The, the, it's originally based on the uh, work of Charles Pierce. And what Pierce was trying to discover is, how do Americans think? And what he concluded was that Americans had developed a new philosophy. 
where they looked at reality and then came back and created their thoughts. The pragmatic did not mean to sell out. In Washington today, pragmatic often means selling out. That's not what the term meant. The term pragmatism meant trying to use common sense and your real understanding of real life in order to then formulate a philosophical understanding working back from it. Being pragmatic meant taking in all the data, thinking it through, and then reaching a conclusion that fit the realities you were dealing with. And it was seen by 19th century Americans as the absolutely logical way to deal with things. So you didn't start and say, look, here's what I have in my head. Let me now reinterpret reality so it fits what's in my head. It said the opposite. Let me try to understand reality and then come back and think in my head what I should do now that I've been in close touch with the real world. Did not mean you know, to compromise. It did not mean to sell out. It did not mean any of those things. It was, in fact, a way of trying to come in close touch with practical reality, which is why uh, Pierce first writes about it in a popular scientific magazine, not a philosophical journal. He's trying to grab, why are we such an inventive people? Because we're willing to pragmatically try to solve things, as you'll see next week when you talk about the spirit of invention and discovery. This is a country which has a huge drive to invent, to discover. To, you know, Benjamin Franklin invents the lightning rod. Why does he invent it? Because he wants lightning to quit hitting buildings. How does he invent it? He tries to figure out something that will draw the lightning, the electricity away from the building. I mean, why did he use the product he used? Because it worked. 